So we're going to be reading from 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. So you guys can get that out in your Bibles if you like, or it'll be on the screen here as well. So I'll just give you a minute. Again, that was 2 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, with complete patience and teaching. This is the word. Let's pray. Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Let's pray really quick here. Ask the Lord for his help. Well, Lord, we, um, you intentionally give us your Holy Spirit to be able to understand and, and to hear what you're saying. Um, whether we know you or whether we don't, Lord, you, your spirit is not present because of Jesus' work on the cross. And, and now we have a helper who makes sense of the scriptures for us and make sense of what you are saying. And so as we're, as we're meeting and discussing, Lord, what your word says, Lord, we pray that you would give us ears to hear what you were saying. You, you, we pray that you would be with us, calming our hearts um, to be able to sit with you and, um, and help us to be attentive to what you are saying to us and what you're doing in us as we are hearing your word preached. We begin our pray. Amen. So depending on your church experience, uh, you either meet preaching with skepticism or expectation. You, you potentially be preaching having an experience of hurt or an experience of encouragement, or maybe both. John Stott, he's a 20th century pastor from England. He's passed away now, but he says this in one of his books called in, uh, Between Two Worlds. He says this, the prophets in today's church are confidently predicting that the day of preaching is over. It's a dying art, they say, an outmoded form of communication, an echo from an abandoned past. Not only have modern media superseded it, but it is also incompatible with the modern mood. And so there's, there's a slow cultural push against preaching and for preaching to become non-existent because to some, preaching is hate speech. To some, preaching is irrelevant. To some, it's just a pastor's space to kind of get on his hobby horse, begin to talk about the things that he has, it's his favorite topic, and then to sell books based off of it. And so for a non-Christian, it's not too, too far of a stretch to say that the sermon is viewed with negativity. It's actually not a favorite. And so if that's, that's the state of our world, if that's the kind of culture we live in, then, then why preach? So we're doing a sermon series on the values of our church, and one of our values is gospel-centered worship. And that means that we believe that the gospel is what rightly orders our lives and our affections. And so we make it the focal point of our preaching, of our singing, and every part of our worship gathering. And so part of the gospel-centered worship is to actually have gospel-centered preaching. And so what I want to do today is ask two questions uh, to really guide us through this sermon. I want to ask two questions, and they are, what is preaching? And why focus on the gospel in preaching? And so 2 Timothy, the passage that Ben read for us in chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, it actually helps us answer these two questions that we just asked. And so let's start with the first question, what is preaching? And so Paul, he's the author of this letter, and he wrote to his friend Timothy, who had been on many missionary journeys with him. Um, Paul, he's an apostle. Um, and if you don't know what that means, an apostle is, there were 12 men who walked with Jesus while he was here. And if he was his closest friends, he had... He had invested in them, he trained them up, and he, Jesus gave them authority to go preach the gospel. And he gave them authority to, to delegate authority to elders um, within the first century church while they were still alive. And so what's really unique about Paul, though, is that Paul is an exception. Paul wasn't walking with Jesus while he was around, um, while he was alive, but Jesus specifically revealed himself to Paul. And he called Paul specifically to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, you, you might know Gentiles to mean someone who's not a Jew, but Gentile is also code for you're not a Christian. That's pretty derogatory. And so Paul planted many churches 
with this new authority that Jesus had given him. And one thing he did is he developed elders in every local church that he planted. He planted many churches, probably the best church planner that this world would ever know. And so when he, when he set elders over those uh, local churches, he delegated authority to them. And one of the things that an elder was supposed to do was preach the word. An elder has, and actually, you might have experienced churches that they have more than one elders, and that's biblical. It's not biblical to have just one elder. But an elder's responsibility is to oversee a church, and there's a plurality, a group, uh, uh, more than one elder. And as a part of their responsibilities and duties to oversee the church is preach. It's one of their roles is to preach. And so Paul, he left one of his closest missionary partners, that's Timothy, at a church called Ephesus to function as an elder to train up new elders. And so just to give you a picture of where Ephesus is, if we can get it up here really quick. It's right there. The big, fat black arrow is pointing. And so Timothy's there, and he's writing to them. And in verse 2, Paul tells Timothy to preach the word. And so to preach means to be a herald. A herald is, is someone who announces someone else's message. It's crazy to think about. A herald was usually a messenger of a king. He, was, he went to other kingdoms with the king's message to announce this message that his king had told him to announce to other kingdoms. I don't, I'm, I'm not promoting this movie, but you might have known the epic scene in 300 where he yells, this is Sparta. The person he kicked down the hole was a herald. He had another message, and he didn't like it. And so notice what Paul is telling, uh, telling Timothy to, to preach. He's telling Timothy to preach the word. To preach the word. What's the word? The word is all of scripture. So if you scroll up or you turn your page or you look at the same page, depending on what kind of device or actual paper Bible you have, in 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul tells Timothy that all scripture, all scripture is breathed out by God. And so at face value, what Paul is saying is that the Bible, the scriptures, what we know as the Bible is God's very word. God speaks through the Bible to us. He communicates to us through his word. So when you're reading it, God's speaking to you. And so when he tells Timothy to preach the word, he's not just saying simply to read it and then talk about it. He's telling Timothy what it means to preach. He's telling him how to preach. And so in verse 2, he tells him, reprove, re -re rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. And so to reprove means to show where someone has gone wrong, and it's demonstrated in their actions and in their character. And so it's usually seen in the evidence and the pattern of their life. So you can notice if someone's falling out of line based off of the pattern of life. Rebuke is kind of like a twin sister to the word reprove. To rebuke someone means to warn someone about their actions to prevent them to, from continuing in it. And so you're telling them not to do something because, it will, because of how it will affect them. Because their life is out of line in some way with the gospel. And anytime you see that happening in the Bible, it's usually because they're doing something that will affect their own faith or the faith of the community, the church that they're a part of. That's usually when review happens. And then to exhort means to encourage or plead for someone to do what's right, to do the right thing, to do what's good for them. Sometimes it means actually consoling, comforting people, or, or, or a group of people, or individual. So, more often than not, whenever you see reproving, rebuking, and exhorting in the scriptures, you actually see them happening all at once. It's never, it's never really the, the biblical model to just to reprove or rebuke. There are people who like feel like it's God's, their God's gift to the world to rebuke people. Yeah. To like tell them that, hey, you're wrong, and I'm gifted to do that. That's not the that's not the picture the Bible's giving. Anytime reproving and rebuke, rebuking happens, it's because there's also an exhortation that needs to happen. There's an encouragement, and it's always in relation to the gospel. And so when Paul tells Timothy to preach the word, part of preaching is to teach. Teach. And so to teach in the New Testament meant to provide instruction and in how the scripture should shape the way that we live because of Jesus' death and resurrection on the cross. That's the mode of preaching. And part of teaching is reproving and rebuking where culture is going off kilter and where someone's life is not aligned with God's word. And so you have re reproving, rebuking, exhorting, and it comes with teaching. Right? So if you're if you're thinking, when's the moment to reprove or rebuke? Well, you look at God's word, and if someone is out of line with that, that is the basis to do that. But it's not the basis to do that if you just don't like the way they're doing something. 
right? So you're never really going to rebuke somebody for how they make coffee, right? If they're making pour over and you're like, no, I'm a drip person, that's not a moment to rebuke someone because clearly pour over is better. Just kidding. But preaching, preaching essentially is taking a passage of scripture, teaching what it says, and then applying the truth to how it should change the way someone thinks, the way they feel, and the way they live. And so if you're wondering, what is application? Because I feel like that's like a Christian word. Application is literally answering the question, what am I supposed to do with this information? What am I supposed to do with what I just heard, what I just learned? And so not long ago, one of my mentors, uh, Pastor Brett, actually, both Levi and I, uh, Levi still works with Pastor Brett. I used to, I um, here. Um, but Pastor Brett was preaching a series not too long ago in Second Peter chapter three, and in Second or First Peter chapter three, and, and in First Peter chapter three, it addresses marriage and how husbands and wives should live within their marriage. And so when he was talking and telling the meaning of First uh, Peter three, he gets into he gets into rebuking and reproving and exhorting mode. He begins to apply it to the congregation. And so he's talking to the congregation, okay, so if you're a husband, this is what this means for you. If you're a wife, this is what this means for you. And this is what Christ calls us to. And he's sitting there um, telling us ways that we can apply scriptures. And so when I'm listening to Brett, and I think many people who were there were having the same feeling, um, when I was listening to Brett, it started, I started thinking about what am I like as a husband? And I began to ask my wife, honey, how do you experience me as a husband? All of a sudden, by hearing the scriptures preached and then hearing how it's, it's applied, I begin to wonder, how am I living in accordance with it? How am I lining up with it? And it, be, and it begins to, it begins in a sense to read me. It begins to make me think, man, where am I, where am I not lining up with the scriptures? And what it did for me is it brought great correction. Apparently, I wasn't a good encourager to my wife. And so now I'm working on being a better encourager. And I'm still growing in that area. I'm not a great encourager. But that all came about because of the teaching of Scripture. Because the Scriptures were taught, there was moments of reproving, rebuking, and exhorting, encouraging, encouraging, pointing me to the Gospel, how this is possible. So that's what, that's what those four things do. And so whenever you read the Scriptures, it's teaching you what God says about Himself. It teaches you what it says about you, actually about humanity and our world. It has... The Bible has something to say about everything that exists in our world today. And every time you read it, you begin to notice that something about your view of God, about your view of yourself, or even the world is off. And variably, every time you read the scriptures, you might notice something's off. Something's off about the way I think about God, myself, and our world. And so, though it might be hard to hear that something's off about you, it's actually God's gift to you. <laughs> It's God's gift to you because you'll notice that every time you notice that something's off kilter about yourself, God's response to you is gracious. To say, hey, this is where you're off, but this is what I'm calling you to, and I give you the means to do it. So God never crushes you. God never just destroys you. He says, hey, hey, here's where you're off. This is who I am. This is who you are. And I've given you my son to be able to redeem you and make you into what you ought to be. And so God's goal for the Bible is is for, for you and me to see who he really is and who we really are so that we could be restored to him. And so, and the way that you see this is, the way that you see it the clearest actually is the gospel. You need the gospel to see clearly and you'll only understand that the scripture is what it's saying and what God's intent for it is when you look at it through the lens of the gospel. And so we'll talk more about that in a second. But here's what that means for us. And whenever I preach, Lord willing, when future elders preach, whenever I preach, I want to be keen on making sure that we preach the message of Scripture. So there's not one time that I'm going to preach where I just think, I have this awesome hobby horse that I want to get on, and I'm going to start talking about it. The goal of preaching here at Restoration Hope Church is to look at the Scriptures, to see who God is together, to see who we are together, to understand how our, who, what our world is together, and then to begin to live with this new mind frame given by God. That's the point of preaching. And when we have future pastors, Lord willing, I want to, I want to train up future pastors to preach this way. To, use, like, to not use the scripture, but to take the message of scripture and make it our message. And so that is called expositional preaching. That's the kind of preaching that we want to be about. And if that's new to you, that word expositional preaching, here's a great definition by, Mike, by Mark Dever. He's a pastor in Washington, D.C. 
And he defines expositional preaching like this way better than I could ever say it. He says, simply defined, expositional preaching is preaching that takes the point of the passage and then makes it the point of the message. And as soon as we say expositional preaching, many immediately think of verse-by-verse -verse commentary style preaching through Pauline epistles. Edifying, yes. Boring, probably. But while that may be one way of delivering an expositional sermon, it is not the only way, nor should it be. Expositional preaching should engage the scriptures at every level of every genre. Pause, which means it touches every fabric of life. It has something to say about every single thing that is going on in our world and will go on in our world. It is timeless. And so, unpause. An expositional sermon can be preached on the message of an entire book in the Bible, a quantable book, or even the message of the entire Bible. There's a way to preach to, to preach a sermon and say, hey, this is what the whole Bible means, without going forever. Just as easily as it can be preached on the message of John 1, 1 which is one verse. So there's, a, there's a lot that can happen there. And so what that means for us is that I will preach expositionally. Sometimes I'll preach on a verse. Sometimes I'll preach on a whole book. Sometimes I'll preach on the whole Bible to point at some things. Sometimes that might mean that I focus on some themes or aspects of the gospel. Sometimes that, that might mean that I will focus on one word. But it will mean that whatever the scripture is, is saying, that's what we want to communicate and we want to apply it to our lives. And so I always want to base our sermons off the scripture Never my opinions. But if the point of the sermon is to apply the Bible, then sometimes that means speaking towards appropriate yet uncomfortable topics. Uncomfortable topics that we're uncomfortable talking about on the street or with our friends or with our parents or with our neighbors. We want to talk about everything that the Bible speaks to because the Bible speaks on everything. And so it will feel, sometimes it'll feel like I'm getting in your bubble. Sometimes it'll feel like I'm getting in your elbow room or in your space. Sometimes you'll feel uncomfortable because I'm, I'm speaking to something that the Bible's speaking to in, in our lives, in all of your lives. You might feel like, man, Josh is singling me out, and I'm not, I promise. That's just, that's just God's Spirit working in you. But here's why. It's impossible to read the Bible without realizing and noticing that it's addressing something in you. Right? It's, it's impossible to read the Bible without feeling some kind of way and wondering, God, what are you actually saying to me? Because what God wants to do is he wants to address our sin. He wants to address the things that we worship that's not him. And he wants to do that so that, he, so that we can see who he is and begin to worship him. And when that happens, what's happening to you when you're reading the Bible or when you're hearing that preaching the sermon is exhorting, it's rebuking, and it's uh, reproving. I said that backwards, I realized, but that's okay. And that's also teaching. Um, but hear this. It's not because you're not loved. Because sometimes that can happen. Like sometimes you can hear them, and man, Josh is being hard on me, or man, he's being a jerk. It's not because you're not loved, it's because you are loved. So listen to this from Hebrews 12, verse 7 and 8 and 11. It says this It's for discipline that you have to endure. God is teaching you as sons and daughters. For what son and daughter is there whom his or her father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all, particip all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons or daughters. So just think about that for a second. If you're not disciplined, if you're not treated as a son and daughter, then you're, then you're not a son or a daughter. It's kind of like this, and this is not a part of the sermon, so just bear with me. But it's almost like if, if, I, if, if, you, if you see someone walking down the street and you see them doing something really ridiculous, really caustic to them, and you don't say anything to them, you probably won't say anything because they're not your family. They're not your son or your daughter. You're just going to let them go. But if that is your son or daughter, you're going to get it all up in your space. You're going to say, hey, what's going on? You would never let your kid do something without addressing them. But you would maybe let someone slide who's not your kid. So for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than, than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And so you're addressed because you're loved. And usually a parent addresses their kid because something's it's, it's damaging them. And God addresses you, you in, in your sin or the things that are going in your life because, well, it's killing you. It's destroying you. It's destroying aspects of your life. Maybe relationships, maybe just your own life, maybe 
maybe something that you have going good for you, like like a job that's that God is giving to provide for you, but He's treating you like a son and daughter. So that's what preaching is, and I think in order to preach the Bible faithfully um, and to, to preach the actual message of Scripture, you absolutely have to show how every single passage of the Bible points to Jesus. Like you just absolutely have to. And the reason why that is because that's what the Bible's doing. <laughs> But we'll talk about that in a second. But remember, the reason why we want to talk about the gospel is because it, we, we focus. It's, our, it's the focus of our preaching, our worship, and our singing. But let's still ask the question, why? Why focus on the gospel during preaching? Well, first off, Paul does it as one of the bases of telling Timothy to preach the word. So look at verse 1. He says this, I charge you, look, I charge you in the presence of God and of who? Christ Jesus, who is the judge? Who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom? Paul is slipping in a little bit of gospel language there. And, he, and Paul recognizes that because of the gospel, because Jesus has died on the cross, Jesus has been elevated as king. You don't know that unless you know the gospel. He's been elevated as king, and because he's king, he now sits on the throne as judge, and he will judge all people one day when he returns, and he'll judge you based off of whether you're trusting in him or you're not trusting in him. And so the gospel, essentially, in a nutshell, teaches you that God the Father, he sent his son to die on the cross for you to atone for your sins. He gave you sonship or daughtership. He, the reason why he died is because you had a rebellious heart, and now Jesus came to obey because you didn't obey, and Jesus died to give you his obedience so that you're seen as an obedient son or daughter of God. That's, that's essentially what the gospel is. And because God accepts Jesus' sacrifice, he is sitting at the throne, ruling over everything. Even if it doesn't feel like Jesus is in charge over everything, he is. Because the one thing I always tell people whenever I talk with them about the gospel, whenever they don't believe me, I just always tell, I always tell them, there's a 50% chance that you're right and a 50% chance you're wrong. And if Jesus exists, and you, you better hope your 50% is way bigger than it actually is. Because the only way we'll find out Jesus truly is king is when he returns. And I'm pretty confident he will return. And so Paul's main reason for telling Timothy to preach is because the gospel's true. The gospel's true. It really is true. It really, even though it seems like unbelievable, it really is true. And Paul, he's not the only guy who's doing that. Jesus does it too. So look, in Luke 24, Jesus, he's resurrected from the dead, and there's these two guys who are walking, and Jesus walks, like, he interjects in a conversation, and they're talking about Jesus resurrecting from the dead. Like, that's, that's a big deal, right? Because, I mean, that's just crazy. No one resurrects from the dead, right? That's not the common experience. That, is that your common experience? It's not my common experience. But, but they're talking about this. They're perplexed. They're like, what does this mean? Somebody has risen from the dead, and nobody can find them. And so Jesus, he steps in because they don't understand that this is everything the Bible has been talking about, right? Now, we have a, a little bit of a vantage point because we can read the Bible cover to cover, right? Like they, like Israel, if you're a Jew, like you, you live through it all. Like there's a long history, but it's hard to fit the pieces together unless Jesus does it for us. And so Jesus, he conceals himself and he, co he goes to them in verses 25 and 27, says this to them. And really, this is actually loving when he says this. He says, Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then listen. He said, it says, in beginning with Moses, talking about the Old Testament, the first five books of the Bible. And it says, if that's not convincing, all the prophets. He interpreted for them all the scriptures, the thing, in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And so what Jesus is essentially doing is he's saying, everything that you know of the Bible, everything that happened in your history, it's all been pointing to me. It's all about me. And so Jesus, he helps them understand everything by saying, hey, listen, if you want to understand it clearly, look at me. Look at what I've done. Look at what I've said. Look what I am about. And so when you read the New Testament letters, you'll notice a similar thing. That every single problem that the New Testament writers are addressing it, it's all, they're all addressing it with the gospel. Every problem that they're addressing is a gospel problem. So it's never, it's never simply a political problem. It's never simply a home problem. It's never simply a parenting problem. It's never simply an education problem. It's never simply, you can go down the line. It's a gospel problem. Every time. Because the gospel 
was the main subject and it was the answer to every one of their problems. So for example, Paul, he's written 13 of the 22 New Testament uh, letters and in one of them, not letters, but books, um, in one of them, the main reason why he's writing to them, uh, he's writing to a church in Galatia and, and, he, and it's, it's because they're beginning to believe a false gospel, a wrong gospel, a gospel that's not true. And so here's what he says. In verses, uh, chapter 1, verse 6 through 9, it says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. So this is why he's writing to them. I did it. Like, he's not writing, he, I mean, he, there's a couple of reasons that he's writing also, but like one of the first things he brings up is like, hey, you're believing a wrong gospel. And that's how important it is. <laughs> That's important. That's why it's so important what you believe. Not just not just a, a list of, of doctrines, but that you believe and know the gospel. It's that important. But even if we are an angel, now this is big. If we are an angel, somebody, man, that's crazy. Um, if we are an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. Paul is essentially saying anybody, anybody, I don't care who they are, I don't care if they got a Mercedes. I don't care if they have a Rolls Royce. I don't care if they have like the best car. I don't care. I don't care if they have a lot of money. I don't care if they're the president. If they're preaching to you a different gospel, let them be accursed. Whoa. As we said before, so now I say it again: If anyone is preaching to you a gospel or a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. So we don't have time to read this one, but at some point this week, I want to encourage you to read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19 through 30, and just look at what Paul says about the gospel. And look and notice how everything that 1 Corinthians is about stems from that, and Paul is making the main aim of the gospel. So the New Testament writers, they focus on understanding our world in light of the gospel. Everything. Every part of it. Because that's the full focal point of the scriptures. Every single part of the scriptures. I guarantee you, I think if you just, if you notice, if you pay attention, if you slow down, you'll notice that Jesus is everywhere in the scriptures. Even in Genesis 1. So, here's an example where, where that we're starting to see this in our life. Um, all of our DNA groups are, and DNA groups are part of our gospel community groups, so um, if, you, if you want to be connected with us a little bit more, one of the ways to do that is to be a part of a gospel community group, and that's our way of doing life together. But we have DNAs as, as a part of that, and our, all of our DNAs are going through a study called the Gospel Fluency Handbook. And in that book, it, it does a really good job of showing you how the gospel really is a focal point of all the scriptures. But, um, but one exercise it, it has us doing is reading scripture passages and then asking the question, how do you see Jesus in this passage? How do you see him? Where do you see him? Um, and so for one of the guys in the group, uh, this is really cool for me to watch, I think, but... Um, but one of the guys in the group, he, one of the passages that stood out to him was Ephesians 6. And, and if you know Ephesians 6, you, it's the armor of God passage. It talks about what the armor of God is. And so it says that um, to put on the breastplate of righteousness, what is that? Um, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the boots of the gospel, and the belt of truth. And so we're asking this question, where do we see Jesus in this passage? And, and, and so he's he sharing for us how this hit him, and he's... He just realized that as he's reading it, asking that question, that Jesus is his armor. That Jesus is his righteousness. Meaning that Jesus has given him his perfect obedience, his perfect standing, and now God looks through Jesus kind of like a lens and sees that man, all of us, or in you, women, as righteous. Jesus is Jesus is the gospel. He's the boots of the gospel. Jesus is the encouragement that, that is given to us to walk and go share the gospel. Jesus is is the shield of faith. He is our faith. He gives us faith. He's the reason why we have faith. I could go on. But he just realizing this and just sharing this with us, and it, it's, it's, it's clear beyond reason that Jesus is all over the scriptures. And so the gospel, it's a focal point in the scriptures because Jesus, Jesus is the focal point. Everything's pointing to Jesus. So I'm going to talk about Jesus a lot from, from up here. And I'm gonna, whenever I talk about the Bible, at some point, I'm going to talk about Jesus because I want to reflect and model what the, what the Bible is doing. And so we only understand the Bible clearly when we, when we look at it through the lens of the gospel. 
if you don't look at the scriptures and get to the gospel, you're missing a step. You don't see clear enough. And here's, here's, here's one way that, that affects us. If you don't read the Bible with the gospel as a focal point, you'll read the Bible and one or two things will happen to you. Because as you're reading it, you'll, know, you'll, you'll feel like it's saying, do this, do this, do this, you have to do this, you gotta do this, when are you gonna do this? And one or two things are gonna happen to you. One, you might be full of pride because you're one of those people who probably, who, who are able to do anything you can in this life. Anything you put your mind to, you'll do it, you'll succeed, and then you'll be full of pride because you'll think God loves you because, well, you're awesome. Because you're able to do it. But if you're not that person, then the second thing will happen to you. You will be filled with discouragement and despair. Because you'll try to do it, and then you'll fail. You'll fail, you'll fail, you'll fail, and then you'll think that God doesn't love you because well, you feel like you're a failure. But if you, if you read with the gospel in mind, what it does to you is it reminds you that all of your performance, every bit of it, is never good enough in order for God to love you. Because Jesus' performance is way better than this. But it also reminds you that it, it reminds you that our failures to obey perfectly is never a hindrance for God to love us. So the gospel does like this double whammy. It gets us from both sides. It says, hey, your pride is pointless because it's not enough. But it says, hey, your failures are pointless because it doesn't hinder me from coming to you. And that's why the gospel is good news. That's why you need to read the scriptures through the lens of the gospel. And so, man, the gospel empowers us. Empowers us to do things we're scared to do. It cements our sonship and daughtership. It gives us constant hope, telling us that, hey, Jesus has died for your past sins. Hey, Jesus is, is working for you and working against your current sins. He has paid for your future sins. And it gives you hope that one day Jesus will create a new heaven and new earth where sin does not exist, where it doesn't destroy you, it doesn't destroy your relationships, it doesn't even destroy the way that you treat the creation. It gives you joy. So anytime I preach, anytime I tre- preach, I try to answer these four questions. How does the gospel make this passage possible? Where do I see the gospel in this passage? How does this passage make me run to Jesus more? And what aspect of the gospel am I reminded of? So I I encourage you, um, if you you don't have those now or or I'm going too fast, I encourage you to take a picture or ask me for them. But I encourage you to ask these questions when you're reading the scriptures. Ask these four questions. And, And here's the deal. I, I'm really serious when I say this. I want you to keep me accountable. So anytime I preach a sermon and you have not heard the gospel, tell me. Um, because that makes me better. If you feel like I have not made clear where the gospel is in the passage, or, you're, or you feel like I'm just giving you another moral sermon, then come tell me, because that, that helps me to stay on edge of preaching the gospel. And I'm serious about that. <laughs> and one of the things that will happen is, man... I, you'll make me better as a preacher, or it might be a moment where we just talk about the gospel some more, and we both benefit from that. But, but hold me accountable, because we want every aspect of our service to point to the gospel. So, so what is preaching? Preaching is taking the message of scripture and then making it the message of the sermon. So preaching is. And why focus on the gospel in preaching? Well, we focus on the gospel because we only understand the Bible clearly when we look at it through the lens of the gospel. And so we believe the gospel is what rightly orders our loves and our affections, and so we make it the focal point of our preaching, our singing, and our worship gathering. And we, and we really do. We really do want to order our lives because our lives have been disordered by sin, and God, guess what? He's on a rescue mission to reorder our lives through the gospel. So we want to order our lives because we are disordered, every part of us. There's not one person in this room who's not jacked up. And, and God's on a rescue mission to reorder your life. And that's the good news of the gospel. Let's pray. Father, well, sitting here um, earlier today, just reading Matthew six, and I'm just reminded that even in prayer. Um, Jesus tells disciples that you know you know everything we need. And so it makes me ask the question, why do I even pray? If, I, if you know what I need, why do I even pray? Um, because you want to give it to us. 
pray because it's a reminder that you just love being with your children. You love being with those who are yours and you love to give. And, and part of that relationship is, is just talking to you about what you have done for us, thanking you for what you have done for us, and then being reminded of what you've done for us. And every time we read the scriptures, we're reminded of what you have done for us. We, we, we are reminded of who you are, of who we are, um, and, and, and what you have done um, in the creation and what you are doing. You reveal your purposes. You give us and remind us of our purpose. So thank you that you do that, Lord, that, that, you're, that your word, the scriptures, is a timeless gift. It's, it's one of the best gifts you have given us. It's amazing that this book... Um, has stood the test of time, so to speak. That not only is it one of the best-selling books in America, but um, but also that it, it just has spoken uh, throughout time because you speak the scriptures. And so, God, thank you for that. Help us to not only realize that, but Lord, help us to go now wanting to read our Bibles, not because we're guilted, but because we we know that you you want to talk to us. We know that you do love us, and and help us to rest in that because of what you've done through Jesus. So we ask um, that you would speak to us in the, in the coming days and weeks and for the rest of our life as we read the scriptures. In our name I pray. Amen.